What defines you? Each and every single person in this room possesses their own individual identity. Now I want all of you to take a moment. Close your eyes and be as honest and as candid with yourself as you possibly can. And I will ask, what defines your identity? How much control do you have over your identity? We all have a vision for ourselves. Who do you want to be? Are you living as your best self? If not, how will you get there? You may open your eyes now. I want you to keep those thoughts running through your mind throughout the rest of my talk. Now I'm going to tell you about a few people I know. So I want you guys to all think of the one person we know who is constantly overachieving. The person who does everything and manages to do it all with seamless perfection. Now I knew a person like this too. Let's call her Alex. And Alex's life was pretty normal until her freshman year of high school. In early fall, after several missed diagnoses, she was diagnosed with a chronic genetic disorder called cystic fibrosis. CF disables the body's ability to transfer chloride in and out of cells. This results in excessive amounts of concentrated mucus in several passageways in the body. We're talking about lethal complications in both the respiratory system and the digestive tract. Now, since cystic fibrosis is a hereditary disorder, it points to the generalization of diagnosis at or soon after birth. However, for Alex, this was not the case. She, after 14 years of living a completely asymptomatic life, her life did a 180. Now, I want you to go back to that overachiever from before. Think about them and how they would feel, per se, losing a loved one. Um, <laughs> the feelings of sorrow and despair they would endure. Now, in the similar way, Alex had lost her health. The body that was merely a vehicle to achievement and success was now her biggest enemy. This body now placed her in hospitals nearly every other month, not to mention the time-draining treatments necessary to keep her lungs functioning. These treatments often took up to three hours a day and consisted of inhaled medications, oral medications, and percussion treatments. But even all of this was not enough to stop the deterioration of her lungs. At an extremely low point, her lungs were functioning, functioning at a mere 50%. Now imagine the tight sense of restriction down your throat and a sense of panic when feeling like only one of your lungs is working. Needless to say, this adversity had taken a toll on Alex's mental well-being. Having been very close to her, I watched her progress through every stage of grief. Overwhelming hopelessness and anger were consuming her. And she would often ask things like, What's the point of living if my life will be cut short anyway? Well, the ultimate question here is, how do we face the confusion of identity when tragedies interfere with our goals? And so I used to tell Alex that, to overcome one's breath, you must learn to accept that it is yours. Identity is a very complex notion. There are so many obstacles and platforms that at times it can feel nearly impossible to define it let alone understand it. And for Alex here, this was a major issue. She often felt like people only saw her for her illness, as the person who was always sick or never in school. But ultimately, she had a choice. She could give in to this overbearing illness and let it literally take over her. Or she could choose to actively go on with life, take the obstacles for what they were, and define herself for her own identity. So from the beginning of my friend's freshman year until now, she has endured quite the transformation, but not in a negative way. So maybe she is not just the perfect overachiever she was before, but she has used these experiences to build a fire in her that is very unique to others. Now, with tragedy comes pain, grief, and sometimes a lifelong continuing struggle. But she, over the years, she learned to persevere through these and ultimately define herself for her real worth. Now, um, now, another person I knew, let's call him John. And John faced unthinkable adversity in his high school years as well. He endured a long and continuing battle with an eating disorder, more specifically anorexia nervosa. For those of you who don't know, anorexia is a psychological disorder in which someone has an irrational fear of gaining weight. They often go to extremes of dieting and exercise to avoid it. In fact, according to the National Association of Anorexia Nervosa and Associated Disorders, 
at least 30 million people of all ages and genders suffer from an eating disorder every year in the US alone. Eating disorders have the highest mortality rate of any mental illness. In fact, every 62 minutes, one person dies as a direct result from an eating disorder. Now my friend John's struggle started with a slow descent into a deep depression. He was constantly feeling sad, exhausted, and overwhelmed. His life felt very out of control as he had described it to me. And so all he had was these constant replaying thoughts of self-hatred. But these all had a focal point, the body and its appearance. And so John felt so strongly about this that he began to diet in order to lose weight. Now, of course, in the beginning, it was nothing extreme and everything was innocent. But as time progressed, things took a turn for the worst. Eating healthy had turned into barely eating at all. Every time I was with him, he would avoid food at all costs. And pretty soon, he was disappearing, not just physically, but mentally and socially. Within only a month and a half, he had lost nearly 30% of his body weight and his organs began to shut down. In late winter, he was admitted into the hospital with an extremely low heart rate, a failing liver, and what seemed to be a negative space of a body. And within the hospital, he would stay there for two more weeks and then be transferred directly into a residential eating disorder treatment center. In this treatment center, he would be faced with his biggest fears, which for that matter was not just food. I believe there's ultimately a misconception that eating disorders are strictly about food. And frankly, it's the opposite. Eating disorders result in abnormal behavior around food as a result of trying to cope with underlying mental struggles. And for John here, these came out of feeling out, out of control in his life and his obsessive or perfectionistic qualities. And so, I'll, just as Alex did, John too struggled with identity. There's often so much focus on his appearance and the way it was changing over time that it felt like there was all there was to him. So he ultimately had a choice too. He could let his mental illness and his weight define him, or he could go on with life and work hard to overcome it. John chose the path to recovery and a true sense of self. Any kind of recovery is never linear. There are highs and lows and relapses, but what really matters is one's ability to build the strength to overcome those things and recognize himself for that. Now, eating disorders often disguise themselves as a false sense of control. John was able to gain back control. The anorexia had taken away from him. And you too can gain back the control that, um, that adversity can take away from you and gain control over your identity and how others perceive it. Now, in the beginning of this speech, I asked you to honestly consider what defines you. I stressed the importance of an honest and candid assessment. However, I've been a hypocrite because I've not been honest with you. Alex and John, the two people I just described to you, do not actually exist. Both of these people were me. So right here, um, my, what's my freshman year? I spent most of my freshman year in the hospital um, through the diagnostic process and um, continuing into sophomore year, which was also spent mostly in a hospital. And at this point was a very low point in my eating disorder and within weeks I was hospitalized. And here is me today. So when talking about any kind of adversity, I think it is extremely important to understand the concept of intersectionality. Intersectionality is defined as the intersections between different dis disenfranchised groups and minorities. More specifically, the interactions between different systems of oppression and discrimination. So in the same way that I'm not just a race or gender or sexuality, I'm not just my eating disorder or cystic fibrosis. So yes, the two do affect me and are often together building an even harder obstacle to face. For example, when my doctors tell me to exercise to clear my lungs, it puts me at a great risk when exercise addiction was a huge part of my eating disorder. But the amazing thing is, is these two things together have ultimately built a great motivation to keep myself healthy. Because when one illness falls, the other usually follows. And so keeping myself in check is pretty much a necessity. Um, of course, building a positive and honest identity does not happen overnight. And when in the crucible of struggling with adversity, it can feel like 
Everything you've ever known about yourself or about the world around you has vanished and been taken over by an excessive amount of hardship. But ultimately, it is these hard experiences that, that serve as the best catalyst for an authentic identity, which each and every one of you possess. Now, I want to ask you one last time. What defines you? Who do you want to be? How will you get there? And I challenge each and every one of you to go home tonight. And I want you to take one small step or even just plan something to take yourself one step closer to being the best self you can. How will you define yourself? Thank you.